Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of Terrestrial Tales, Life Stories That Paint a Bigger Picture. Leon? Today we have Michael Nugent with Nugent Group Real Estate. That's right. All right. Welcome, Michael. How are you doing, everyone? Doing well. Doing Happy well. Friday. Happy, Happy Friday. Friday. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a good day today. Thank you. So Michael is a uh, real estate professional, mm -hmm. real estate investor. Two. Business owner. Also. Family man. Always. World traveler. Trying to with all this thing going around. Mm, crazy times. Crazy times, but it's good times. Good times. Um, different times. Different times for sure. Mm -hmm. But we're adjusting. That's yeah. what we do. Always. We assimilate. We've done this a few and times. Conquer. Oh, heck yeah. We Not have. quite like this. No, nope, this nothing yeah. like this. But, but <laughs> similar. And that's what gets this, you know, you and I were talking the other day and we were just having a conversation. But what I thought was really, because I'm looking to buy property and I want to buy property probably in the next few months. Got kids going to college. And how do I do it? And I know how to do it because I'm in the industry, but this was different. I'm looking at the multiple listing service. I'm looking at listings and I'm seeing forms that I don't know. I'm seeing lots of different ways now. And I start to think about, well, how are you going to navigate this environment now? And that's one of the big reasons why I thought it'd be great to talk to you today is how, how this is going to be going forward. You know, I don't know if everything's going to go back to normal, but for sure things are different now when you're buying houses, viewing houses, selling houses, renting houses, investing in real estate. So I think that um, that conversation will be really interesting to, to talk about and to let people know this is how this is going to look if you want to buy a house this summer, this fall, next year. But before we get there, what I really want to do is share a lot about who you are and get to know you and have the listeners get to know you because I know you and um, Evan knows you a bit, but the listeners don't. So your life story is very interesting. So thanks, man. I want to hear. Uh, I'd like to talk to, to to you about that and have the listeners hear that. So um, tell us a little bit about where you're from. You know how old you are, what you're doing now. So share a little bit about that. Well, I was born and raised in Lima, Peru, the country of the good ceviche and pisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the pleasure to be there up until I was 16 and a half before I transitioned over to the United States. Mm, nice. Yes. And then did you speak English when you came to the United States? Well, you know, I knew how to count until 10, and then I knew black and white, dog and cat, but that was about it. Wow. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. So grew up speaking Spanish. Yes. In Lima, Peru. Everything. Okay. Spanish was the main language. We did have uh, English as, you know, as a, as a second language to learn, but, you know, I came here in such a young age that I didn't really get an opportunity to learn it. So I did learn everything here. I, I went to high school. I went to night school with my mom, and that's how I got onto it. Oh, and here, just for listeners, we're in Southern California. Oh, so yeah. we're in Southern California. So did you come to Southern California first, or where did you come when you came no, to the U.S.? No, actually, um, when we got on the plane, it was my sister and I first, and we arrived into Miami. Ah. Uh. That Miami Airport. Okay. So we were there for about a couple of weeks mm -hmm. with uh, one of my uncles that lives there. Mm -hmm. And then once my mom and my brother took a plane to Miami, we got together and flew out to Southern California right. into the LAX and then drove about 52 miles east to Corona. No. Where we made our new home. That's, I didn't know that. Cause yeah, you, man. Because you, you talk about Corona a lot. I know you've done a lot of business in Corona, Riverside area. Oh, yeah. That's the but I didn't know that's where you first Epicenter of our wow. business. Yeah. Huh. So back then, it was a lot different than it is now. You know, it was like driving into this ranch with horses and flies and, you know, strawberries mm -hmm. growing on the side of the road. It was a lot different than what it looks like today. Today, there's a lot of people here. There's a lot of people. It's super dense. Mm -hmm. uh, economically speaking, is I think a lot better, but they have paved those beautiful orange groves yep. into a lot of commercial, executive, retail, industrial nowadays, mm -hmm. mostly because of Amazon just taking over the, taking over the world. Mm -hmm. But, 
Yeah. Yeah, we have a big airport here, San Bernardino International Airport, and Amazon's taking that over. UPS is taking that. About time somebody does something with that. Yeah, we needed the money for the city. Oh, that I was bet they need the money. Good. So you came here at 16, didn't speak English. Nothing. Wow. How did that feel when you came? Like you're coming to America, which is... Well, you know, I mean, I didn't want to come. I'm only a teenager. I'm 16 years old. I don't understand why we had to come. But if I may talk about the reason why mm -hmm. we came, it was primarily because um, my parents split up oh. when I was really young. I was only five years old. And then we had a big issue with uh, Shining Path, which is a terrorist group. And I think that the turning point for my mother to make the executive decision to relocate here was when we were coming back from a birthday party on a bus. And I remember just sitting on the inside the bus next to my mom. My mom had my sister Rosemary in her lap. And then all of a sudden, we just feel and hear this blast just come through the windows and shattering everything in you know and then it felt like the bus was an empty can of food and just like toddled side to side and then later on we found out that it was a car bomb that this terrorist place in front of some guy involved in politics mm. that they were trying to kill but unfortunately we just happened to drive by and had a blast That's really wow. close to the blast yeah That's that was insane. extremely close and, and this wasn't the first time that we've been close to things like that i mean we've seen banks blow up people get shot i mean this is the mid 80s mm. to late 80s where all this craziness is going on nobody knows about it we're a third country who cares about it right mm -hmm. and then you have all these people trying to bring communism into government and government fighting it back and you know people in universities getting infiltrated brainwashing all these young students just to join forces or bringing paisanos from the andes down here to fight for a cause that they weren't really clear about so that's honestly the main reason why we relocated here my mom was obviously uh, scared of us right. or safety mm -hmm. and it just wasn't a good place so to you grow. grew up in the middle of like a communist strife pretty much in yeah Lima. yeah how do you think that shaped you know who you are today how did you how did that alter you you know i think it makes you alert mm. it makes you very alert about your surroundings mm -hmm. it makes you sort of like look beyond what it is like what could this turn into like pattern recognition like pattern recognition you know how they teach you to like not only look left and right and behind and in front of you when you drive but you actually got to look at the driver next to you and kind of like see what he's going to do or she's right. going to do yeah sort of like that like yeah you look at the driver not like it's a just a car but it's actually a person behind the wheel right yeah. it's like something that may provoke something else so i think um that made me alert mm. Mm. That's a good skill to have, though. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think so. Yeah. You're growing up so fast. Like, when at a young age, when you see bombings and, you know, buses with windows blown out and people, you know, in upheaval and governments, you know, that that's really different than maybe what a lot of young people today are dealing with. Different oh, oh, yes. It, it definitely, you know, makes you alert about your surroundings, but also sort of, like, develops this inner gratitude for for life because you don't know if it's going to happen to you the next day right. so well there's also an innocence that's lost yeah because once for that sure. happens you yeah. know you you now know something different you know now you know like okay there's a really dark ugly side to right. to humanity sometimes right and so as a young person that's going to start forming some serious thoughts and processes in your in your mind yeah that's for sure but I was thankful enough. I don't know if I want to call it thankful because, you know, because of my parents splitting up when I was only five. My younger brother was three and my little sister was only one and a half. As a big brother, you know, uh, with a single mom now, mm -hmm. you have to assume that father figure responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you assume that makes you more responsible, makes you more alert about what's needed. So when all these terrorist attacks, started 
I was sort of like, okay, this is what we need to do. Don't freak out. Mm. Uh, let's just get it done and move on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Interesting too about the just you know, our stories, our podcast is not about terrorism, but it's interesting you bring it up because it is part of our life yeah. again today now. Um, I I did grow up with a little bit of that too in England, so we always had the IRA. So there's always the Irish were always bombing the English. So the same thing, we would leave a train station and it would have just blown up, and it's news. I'm like, wow, we were just on that train. So I I kind of grew up with that as well yeah so that's so cool because you, you understand a lot mm-hmm. of people wouldn't understand right. and they're like yeah right no but it is out there it's real it's yeah. real and when you're in the mix it's like wow mm. but like anything you know you learn to take precaution assimilate and be more street smart about what you do so now you're here at 16 in corona 16 and a half 16, man I, in I high arrived. school now yes so you're you go into esl classes or yes go- english a second class man so i got here in january 15th of 1989 mm. okay so i went to a high school they i felt english writing and reading obviously mm-hmm. and ace everything else uh, obviously, the level mm. of education uh, and my benefit wasn't as advanced as how it is back home, how it was back home. Mm-hmm. So I was able to catch up really quick. And then, um, yes, I started going to school right away, Norco High School. Mm. Uh, talk about a culture shock, man, because wow. What Norco, was that like in Norco in California, coming at 16? <laughs> man, I mean, I come from Miraflores, which is a city where... Your backyard is the beach, so you're oh, body yeah. surfing and yeah. boogie boarding and surfing and just hanging out, beach bumming it. A little bit more like a like a paradise then, like right, more laid back. Yeah, it's totally laid back. No, not a paradise because don't you forget the, the bombing. Yeah. yeah, but it's so, a really good city. It's a big metropolitan city. It's on a the good coast, metropolitan coast, city. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of freedom for children my age. Right, uh, we don't have uh, the twenty one age limit for right. drinking so mm-hmm. i mean on a saturday morning you could see me going to the store to pick up a bottle of rum for my mom to make it you know pineapple upside down oh, cake nice. mm-hmm. wow and it's not a big deal yeah yeah so it, it was culture shock yeah. because you come here you know it smells like a big old farm with horses mm-hmm. number one then you need to be 21 to drink mm-hmm. and then you don't speak a league of english and everybody he's, hears you speak, and they look at you like an alien, like, "Oh, what the hell? Who is this wow. guy?" You yeah. know? Yeah. And so that that was that was tough, yeah. man. That was tough. But you know, I've seen worse. I've been through worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm like, I can do this. You That's think no that problem. helped you assimilate, maybe? Oh, dude, big time, mm. big time. Because um, I it was uh, it was brutal because it was about eighty percent, you know white people mm. in Norco. And so I was part of a minority. Right. Like so a true minority. It was like yeah. 10% and 10%, you know, browns and, and, and black people. Okay. So you are like that minority and you feel like the minority. And we, in and what we, way? Because I mean, it's just a few of us. Right. I don't really understand the language. So that's a barrier. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a temporary barrier. Yeah. So, it, and I'm a teenager. I'm still insecure. I don't know what's going on. It's not my right. click. Yeah. So I'm just trying to to assimilate. I'm trying to to integrate. Right. You know. And then what do you think was like the pivotal moment? Maybe because you seem like you know this is your home now. So oh, this how is my home. Exactly. I mean, honestly, at this point in my life, I'm 47. I know I look 30, but <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't go back to Peru, man. There's just mm. no way. Yeah. Really? You know, this is my home. This is where my mom is. This is where my children are. You know, yeah. I mean, now I eat cheeseburgers. Mm-hmm. Oh, so where was that assimilation point, you know? I think the assimilation point came when in high school. I was mm-hmm. still in high school. It was probably wow. about an, a year and a half when I actually graduated from high school where I thought, well, you know, this is going to be home from this point on mm-hmm. because... I started looking at the different opportunities mm. that I was given. Like, you go to school, they feed you, you know, right. uh, there's a structure, you know, you leave school and you get on a road, there's no potholes, 
There's nobody trying to break the window and steal your purse. There's or nobody you trying up. to blow jump. you up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So safety was sort of like key for me to like make that transition mentally. Uh, that's that's very interesting. It was you felt safe. So then, okay, now that I feel safe and I understand my surroundings and where I am, now I can go and make friends and socialize and like start to build up a, a circle. That's cool. Okay. Correct. And right after that, you know, you start building your little circles. Right. And, you know, just like Liam, we're, because we're world travelers. We like right. to get around. Yeah. You know, we're not just stuck in one place. And so you're fluent in English and Spanish, right? Now I am. So you can travel better and assimilate better oh, now. Oh, yeah, man. That's awesome. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, when you were, so 16, though, you were still, you're old when you came from Peru. Like, at 16 years old, you that's that's a lot of living you've done in Peru. What were some of the things? Because you, Peru, I've got to imagine, is a pretty amazing country. I mean, we're talking it about some beautiful. of the, the negatives, but you have that. I mean, you could find that in a lot of places. Yeah. But what about like with your family? Like, what were some of the family values? Like, did you grow up? You know, um, what was the work ethic? You know, when you how how did you, did you grow up wealthy? Did you grow up poor? Like, what was that like? Well, let me start off like this. You know, Peru was. And I think, to a degree, still is a third world country. Mm. Okay, it has a corrupted government. Um, it has people that are proud of their culture, but not necessarily like to follow rules. Mm. Okay, um, the cultural aspect of it is amazing. I mean, you have the community with family and friends, which is super strong. And then you have the the amazing beaches uh, all along the coast, mm. and then you have the food, the man. Food. The I food. I mean, you know what I'm yeah, talking, I know about. What talking about. Yeah. I mean, you get the freshest fish. Mm -hmm. uh, produce are amazing. I mean, it is divided into three different regions. You have the coast, mm. where you get the best fish in the world and seafood. Then you drive up a couple hours, and you are probably about eleven thousand feet above ground oh, hi where up. you can see snow and you could probably see some llamas and alpacas <sighs> and you know it's it's cold and then it's dry and then it rains and it's just colorful it's amazing and then if you go more west you drop all the way down to the jungle where mm. the amazon travels oh. and then that's a different world my friend mm -hmm. and you have all this in one place it's kind of like california a little where you've got mountains and beach well, but yeah minus the monkeys and the llamas it's and different like but it's a raw it sounds very raw yeah, yeah you know, it's like, very raw yeah yeah and just but do you have any stories from like the childhood well you, yeah man i mean i i could tell you a thousand stories but maybe i could tell you about you know how i got started into the work arena. yeah yeah, yeah that's right? a good okay. story yeah so I mean, I had a mom who was a hustler. Mm. My mom always had two to three jobs. Mm. So my work ethic comes from my mom. Oh. Okay. Uh, as a mother, single mom uh, with three kids. My dad was involved to a degree, but my mom was the deal maker and shaker. Okay. So I, I sort of like grew up watching her. And then I remember... Remember, this is a third world country, so and being a single mom is really tough. Uh, making you know ends meet is extremely difficult. So, I mean, as a really young age, I we would like love to vacation a lot at the beach, and then my mom decided one day, okay, I'm gonna rent a kiosk, and I make amazing chicken salad sandwiches. Mm. And we're going to get a bunch of beer and Inca Cola, which is, uh, you know, it's yeah. Peruvian it soda. Like bubble gum. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's delicious. It's heaven in yellow liquid in a cold yeah. bottle. Yeah. And then, um, and I was like, okay, so what are we going to do? Well, you guys are going to get these styrofoam little containers. You're going to walk around in your pretty, you know, swimming suits. And you're going to sell them. <laughs> How or, old were you? Oh, I think I was nine okay uh, yeah, wow years so you started hustling at nine with your mom at nine years old is when i started my first hustle selling chicken sandwiches at nice. the beach nice. right and i remember the beach it was san bartolo in santa maria that's where mm. i started and this is back in 1983 
84. No, eight, eight, yeah, 83, 84. And how did I that think. go? Did you see money come in? Did it work? You know what? Well, yeah, I saw the coins coming in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't really have an understanding of the value of money because remember, I'm only nine years old. But then it, 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 that changed quickly because we moved into this uh, four story apartment complex. And I met some friends who had the great idea to start making caramel apples. Mm. And start selling I love them. Caramel apples, and yeah, can, the man, red, the red just, ones and the caramel ones, the candy yeah. ones Ooh, and the caramel. They, oh. it, we have really good apples in Peru. They're so juicy. They're small, so they have a lot of flavor, oh. and they have this really extra forbidden sugar level of yeah. just red coat. And we just go floor to floor and just sell that stuff, and people buy it. And that's but, where the cash started coming in, right and there. That's when the cash started coming in, mm. and then we took it one step further. Mm. Uh, I remember we found this uh, little book of uh, playwrights, and they had really, really cool and short plays. And then we decided, hey, man, why don't we up the sales by holding, hosting plays in oh, no one way. of our apartment complexes? So now we're selling tickets <laughs> for neighbors to come, and then when they come, that you sell the apples. We sell them the ah, apples. Yeah, that's good. And then we, we <laughs> upped it even higher, man. We started making hot cocoa and tea mm-hmm. and coffee. So then it's when I got my first chunk of change. Mm. And I said, And okay, what age was this at? Oh, I think I was 10. Okay, wow. So you transitioned happened. from 9 to 10, and you yeah. went from selling chicken sandwiches to putting on productions. Yeah, and then it went even higher because at 11... When I turned 11, uh, my mom sent me to live with one of my uncles, and he was an entrepreneur. I mean, he owned a chain of eateries all around the main places in Lima, okay? So I was in charge of collecting the money that every business made Mm. at the end of the day. Oh, wow. And the end of the day wasn't in the early early morning. How How many eateries? Well... He had a popcorn stand. Okay. Okay. Outside a theater, and then inside the theater in Camino Real. Mm. Okay. This is a shopping center in San Isidro City, mm. and then he had this uh, pizza place that was bomb. They made the best New York style pizzas, and they had sangrias and and cold beer. So I managed there. A little bit. I'm 11. And you're yeah. 11. Yeah, I was I'm just going to say, you're like a f- young. Yeah. yeah, very yeah. young. And then they had this smoothie place right next to the pizzeria where you could get your smoothie on. You could get a, a, you know, a healthy chicken sandwich. Yeah. And then you could eat a nice a bowl of a, a fruit salad. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the best business that he had, it was this churreria. They made churros. Mm-hmm. You know, it's this dough mm-hmm. that you run through this metal machine into this boiling kettle of like a uh, stick donut yes like a stick donut and so you fried it you took it out and then you fill it in with this uh manjar blanco which is kind of like dulce de leche Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. thicker Mm -hmm. and not as sweet and then you coated it with this uh powdered sugar oh dude we would sell hundreds of those so that's where i learned about you know, managing a work ethic and work how it ethics works. and how it works. So I did that with him for about a year and a half to two years. When and you started, you said you got your you started to get a chunk of change. What was there things you wanted to buy or you mm. did where that's like, oh, I have my did, was well, did you want to you save know, it? Spend honestly, it? like what well, you know, I didn't want to save it. Um, I always been a big spender, mm. um, and because I was very limited, I didn't have a dad that gave me like you know money or my mom uh i would have to get money to buy clothes okay uh if i wanted to go to a movie or you know buy a little something for a girl i like you know i had to like come up with that money myself so but still you had money, though, and yeah good. you're making yeah. money then so, you got it so my motivation back then was the clothes the yeah. theaters and you know the girls Nice. Yeah. But that's a so good that's motivation good. because yeah, I mean, even to this day, <laughs> that's kind of what my motivation is yeah. today. <laughs> so I get yeah, it. right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I was never able to save any money, to yeah. be honest with you. So that you can see how your work ethic was built, which is amazing. Like that's yes. that's solid. Yeah, because yeah. So that, back then, that's when I I built it. So to so that's now today you're doing the similar thing, except now you're doing houses. 
and you're doing transactions and you're Correct. doing business like a full businesses and investment properties. So Correct. So I'm a licensed real estate agent in California mm -hmm. with a focus in Southern California. And what I do, I help sellers sell their homes for top dollar. And then I assist certain buyers acquire residential real estate as well as land acquisition, which I've been doing a lot of lately because really, yeah. So I, I have a couple of big clients who are selling a lot of land from residential R1, which is uh, where you can build a single family residence, right. one home to commercial where you can have, you know, uh, a truck stop or a mechanic shop, or you can build a car wash. And then what started as a hobby with a good friend of mine, Jose Mas, you know, back in 2008, I think, uh, turned into a little side hustle, which I just fell in love with eventually. And uh, what I do in that section is like I, I buy neglected homes and just beautify them for a profit. That's almost like an art in itself right there. Oh, dude, Beautifying it's so much home. fun to yeah. just buy this thing falling apart and then just l looking at the pros progress, yeah. you know, from day one to day 30th and then putting it on the market and just watching people just going, wow, I got to have that. Yeah, that's so, got to be real special to see that transition oh and man. to see your work come to fruition. And especially you can see it tie into this childhood you had going from just a little caramel apple or a little chicken sandwich to putting on productions and managing eateries. And it yeah. all like, that's where the work ethic I see it to me, it looks like that's taking you now to this real estate and to being able to beautify houses and to put the work in and get the results from it, which is a special thing. It's very special, mostly because it's a family business for us. Mm. My wife, she does all of the interior decorating and decisions as to what exactly we need to do to the house. For example, what kind of floors, baseboards, should we put an island here? Should we knock that wall out? Right. You know, should we build a pool? Should we cover it? So this isn't just paint and carpet. No. Oh, no, we're beautifying. going in, we're yeah. gutting this thing out. And yeah. now we have our children, Michael and Bella, eight and nine, who come to our flips. They help us load up the furniture because we have a lot of furniture, man, too, because we actually stage the homes. Mm. So we're actually, after we finish the product, Why do you stage the homes? Well, because it's statistically, my friend, you know, you sell your house for more money and faster when you decorate it. Mm. You know, you make it more homey. You, you make anyone with no creativity fall in love with a product that you and your head have you beautify it in just collaboration a with other people like my wife in this case right and a little help you know from instagram and uh, all those uh, social media stuff so you're not just oh here's a house that i sold i'm you're putting uh, together you know a presentation oh, of this property yes and then selling it yes that's We're a making different love way to it. yes <laughs> that's a that's a different way to do it for sure. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, you, you had mentioned um, that you said you help sellers get a higher price for their property. Correct. So I wanted to like, what does that mean? Like, like, and it's, it's like what he said there, like, what are you doing to rehab these houses? But I would imagine you're taking some of that same philosophy and helping sellers stage their house. Like, is, how do you, how do they get a higher price? Well, using it, it started first with helping buyers. Okay. I would, as a rookie. I all I had the ability to do because I didn't really have any mentorship behind me telling me what is better. So for me, man, everything is being trial and error. Mm. So everything that I know now is because I learned the hard way. So I started with a pool of buyers. So a lot of hustle, a lot of hours that you invest to put these people into homes. Mm. And then eventually these people mature into their homes. They have children, they grow up and then they have to sell to either upgrade or downsize, mm -hmm. or maybe they want a second or third house, which is the case with a lot of people. Oh, when they they want, they're buying more than one house for themselves? Oh yeah, they're buying homes to invest with their money in, okay? Because eventually we build such a relationship where we exchange ideas and then they catch on the fact that real estate is the way to go. 
investment oh, wise, man. retirement wise, financial freedom. You're wise. building a relationship with your clients. Oh, it's inevitable. Mm. If you're not building a relationship, it's because you're just in for the money. Ah, I see. And honestly, if you are getting into this industry for the money, you're not going to last very long. So it's important that you build that relationship. It's all about relationships. It's not about the money. It's not about that the makes money. makes sense. Because and something that you don't understand, mostly as a young agent, when I was a young agent and I was really hungry, all, all I thought was about a commission. Commission, yeah. commission, commission. But then one thing that I learned from somebody is like, just do a good job. Forget about the money because it's going to show. Yeah. You're going to get, you know, commission breath. And then just do your job. That's very good advice. Yes. Do your job. Don't worry about the money. Yeah. Worry about doing the job that's worth the money. Just do your job. Yeah. And then the money's going to come. Yeah, I like that. And, and it's cool because it, 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 it was true. So it started with buyers. Then I became a listing specialist. And I've been doing this since 2002. Okay. Okay. And obviously, you learn about people, about what they want and what they need. And most importantly, you learn about how to better listen to them. Because honestly, I think the majority of what we do in real estate and lending is listening to the people. To listen and sort of like put a plan together for them. Because everybody's super different. It's all different. I everybody's was that. different. Yeah. So as you grow, as you evolve in this business, you understand the needs of that person. Mm. Well, I'm listening to them is is it's it, in my experience too. It's it's interesting when you listen to somebody because a lot of times they might not be able to express what their true motivation is. Correct, and that's where. Asking questions asking is questions. key because you really need to get to that core. Why? To that why? motivation, that why. I need to sell my house. Well, why do you need to sell and your you house? And you know who I learned that from, my friend? Mm. It, was, it was because of you and Jose introducing me to Joe Stump. Joe Stump. Get to the core. Yeah, your five, six, seven. Those are the probing your questions. Five. So the first few questions are very superficial. Super. It's not until you get to the five, six, seven questions. So Correct. for example, like, like I need to sell my house today. Well, why do you need to sell the house today? Because I want to move. Well, why do you want to move? Well, I need to relocate. Well, why do you need to relocate? Well, because my kids are going to college. Well, so you need to sell your house so you relocate because your kids are going to college. Well, yes. And I want to, and what's important about that to you? Well, I want to be near my kids when they go to college. And why, why do you want to be near your, why is that so important to you? Right. It's like, because I didn't go to college and I need to be there as a family to support each other. And that's what's important about that. So those are, that's a really quick example of how you go deeper into those questions. So the real reason right. is you don't just need to sell your house for the highest amount necessarily, which I'm sure you want, but you have a deeper motivation to move. That's more important Correct. to you. And that's important in communication because business, as you know, is difficult. There's challenges, there's, there's obstacles. And when those challenges come up, how we deal with them is, is key. And there will be, because you must have had a lot of, I mean, it sounds great and we're, we have some good stories, but there must be some big challenges or setbacks that you've had to, to get here. I mean, Oh yeah. I mean, what are some of the <sighs> biggest moments or like, like biggest challenges you think you've had? So you come to America, you graduate. Did you go to college? Yes. Which school? Mm. I Where? went to college. I went to uh, Riverside community college mm -hmm. in Norco and Riverside. I went to Cal State Fullerton, and then I finished in Cal State San Bernardino. Nice. And then uh, when real right. estate? When did the real estate? Happen? The real estate started in 2001, actually. A good friend of mine, Adam Nelson, told me he was licensed to sell homes, and it is amazing that I need to join him. Mm. Okay? And I said, no, no, no. So What I, were you doing at the time? I was bartending. Oh, I was really? a bartender. Mm -hmm. I used to work for Marie Candors, which is now closed. Yeah, they closed all the Marie Yeah, Candors. I don't, I don't, don't know. know. Pies were people don't like the, pies. the bars were good, and the, the, the bar was good, <laughs> yeah. and the pies were good. <laughs> yeah, I met so many amazing people at Marie Candors. Oh, man, we had so much fun there. Mm -hmm. And honestly, working at a restaurant facility taught me a lot about boosting my confidence, mm. how, how to talk to people, right. how to sort of like read people at the same time too. Mm. You know, are they going to tip me? Are they not? Mm -hmm. Which is crucial for real <laughs> estate because you're yeah. now able to build the relationship, which other agents aren't doing. Yeah. Or, you know, you just build that confidence. You, yeah. It's easier for you to talk to people. And I think anyone loves someone mm. with 
enough confidence to carry themselves without the cockiness. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because that just shows, it just makes you feel more at peace. Mm. Right? right. There's a difference between cockiness and confidence and oh, arrogance. Huge. It's, it's, it's a big difference, but yeah. sometimes there's a fine line. I've been told many times by people, oh, you can't do that. You're too cocky, too arrogant. And I think to myself, I don't feel that way inside. I just feel like I'm going to try to do this. It's interesting how sometimes people, they, they can kind of say, maybe you shouldn't do it, or maybe they want to keep you in a box, or maybe there's a fear state, or, or what about if you didn't make it? It's like, well, what about if I didn't try, you know? And so I have been told many right. times, like, you're too young, you're too old, you're too this, whatever. It's like, well, a lot of times when I hear that, or you can't do that, in my life I've heard that. When I hear that, it almost means opportunity. Because it's Always like, means. there's something there. Like, yeah, behind every no, there's a yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah, I found so, that. So 2002 now, so you're, this is like your first career. Like you're bartending as a job, yeah. but real estate gets into, you get introduced to yeah, real estate. I and get introduced becomes, to real estate. And this is your career. And it's so much to learn. I got so caught up on the contracts, yeah. mm. which back then was probably about 17 disclosures. Right now it's probably about 146 of them. What do you mean by this? But just disclosure paperwork that you need to read, fill in, review and explain to clients every time you sell real estate because in this arena like if a house has a leak or like is it stuff like that or what are like disclosures about yes the house? disclosures about everything uh to give you an example there's a disclosure called a tds transaction disclosure statement which has an statute of limitations of five years mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and it is an obligation for the seller to fill it in at the best of their knowledge where they tell you what they know about this house. So, for example, the seller had a, an elderly mom that passed away from, mm. you know, normal whatever. causes, yeah. whatever. S- you have to disclose that right. to the buyer because there are certain cultures where they cannot live with that. Right. Okay. Now, there was a roof leak about two years ago, and we called the homeowner's insurance and uh, demand came to above $5,000. And now you need to tell us that because if that issue fits the criteria of it being about within five years ago and about $5,000, then it may affect the new owners, the new buyers' yeah. insurance premium. Oh, So that so means that you're going to be paying more. Just, yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. So you need a real estate agent, well, a capable real estate agent, to explain that to you. Right. Because, for example, let's talk about the TDS in a different scenario, different geographical location. Let's speak a house on the LA Hills. You know, what do we know about some of the LA Hills? Fire. Right. Okay. So, Santa Clarita, for example, I saw the house there a long time ago. And, well, actually, my first house, I saw the few out there, even though they're like almost an hour and a half from my actual uh, geographical area. But this was helping a friend. We ran into so many challenges getting an insurance to cover him, mm-hmm. okay? So I'm asking all these insurance agents, what do they know? What can we do? And then I just have a one-on-one conversation with the agent. I, I don't think we're going to be able to make it because that insurance premium is coming triple and a half of what he should be paying. And why is that? Because this is a high fire hazard area. And nobody wants to insure there. Mm. So, but does he know this or is like this is part of the TDS, right? It has this to be is, disclosed. Yeah, it, it is disclosed that it's a fire area, that there's been fires in the past, and and that you may be running into issues. Mm, okay, but if they don't yeah. really spell it out as an agent, as right. a good real estate agent, you got to dig. You got to uh, dig more. Yeah. I mean, you have to do your due diligence. So, when you buy a house, when you buy your first house, by default, you're going to get a 17 day window from the time that you open escrow okay until 17 days later to do all your due diligence like research like research okay so it's not only you the buyer the agent has to do most of it like about 99 percent of it Mm. so going back to that story yeah you know just hitting everybody out about information how can we help this guy i ended up having a one-on-one with the owners like hey man what can we do and he told me well when I first bought this house two years ago, I had the same problem. And the seller at that time walked up to me and told me, why don't you just add your name on my policy 
And then when I sell the house to you, I just take myself out. Mm, and I, good. I went back to my insurance agent and he said, and I asked him, can we do this? Well, let me find out. He spoke to the underwriter and she said, yes. Oh, nice. the underwriter said, yes. Mm. So he, he came to me and told me, yeah, you can do it. But do you know this? No, I don't know this. Know. It's like, so now we know. Uh -huh. Okay. That's and this good. is something that only experience and talking and communicating with people will, will help you. But that's so cool because it came from where you were, how you were raised and that, that, you know, driving to build those social skills and then becoming a bartender and, and being building alert. confidence and being, being alert. alert. You know, yeah. and yeah. all of that kind of built you into the, the ultimate agent in a sense, right? Well, like they're able to do it in business though. You know, like you said, alert reminds me of your bus, the, the bombing, the, of the bus, yes. the shining path, because yeah. you get, if you're in a transaction and that comes up, that's like a bomb going off in your mm. transaction. That's a deal breaker. That's a big deal. Yeah. So if you're, if you're expecting a, an insurance premium of a hundred dollars a month and you calculate that in, we as bankers calculate that into the payment. Great. Well, if it's $350 a month, three and a half times the amount, maybe they don't qualify. Maybe they don't want the house. Maybe they can't make the payment. Maybe it's not right. Maybe they don't fit. You know, a lot of times their emotions are, get involved too. I don't want, that's not right. And they get weird about it. I have, cli I've had clients do that too, where right. it's like, well, you have to have flood insurance. Well, why? It's on a FEMA map. Well, I don't want to pay. It's like, well, it's on a federal map. Like I can't change that. So you have to you have to work them through that process. Correct. So that's like a bomb going off. So you're exactly. alert. Exactly. And then to piggyback right on what you just said, it helps to know the core of their motivation to right. remind them, right. hey, you right. know, this is where your children are going to be playing. Mm -hmm. Just let me do my research. Mm -hmm. Let me find out answers. Let me assess the situation. Mm -hmm. And I'll present it to you. If it's feasible, then we do it. Mm -hmm. And remember why you're doing it. But if it's not, then you walk away. Walk and that's away. okay, yeah. too. That's okay. And as an agent, you have to be very careful because there's a very fine line between suggesting and educating and pushing somebody mm -hmm. and steering somebody into perhaps a decision that they should not take. Where do you find that line? Like, where is is it different for different people? Or Yes, uh, everybody has a, a different degree of risk management. Okay, for example, just to be clear with you, you buy a house. Okay, it looks beautiful on the outside. Let's t let's depict the flip for example. Okay, there's a lot of flippers out there. They make this house look beautiful, but then when you bring your home inspector into it, he discovers that there's a lot of issues with plumbing, with the gas pipes, with the electrical, with termite, maybe even the foundation. Okay, so. As a real estate agent representing a buyer, okay, you need to let them know and help them out assess how much it's going to cost them in the event the seller doesn't want to budge or assist. So three things are going to happen. The buyer is going to assume the cost of all the repairs. Mm -hmm. The seller is going to give him a credit or take care of everything mm. or we just cancel. You get your deposit back. Because nowadays, every buyer's deposit is super protected. Oh, okay. Okay, and you move on. Now, in retrospective, with the seller, when you're representing a seller, when I do my one-on-one -on -one about what we're going to do after we sign the contract of him hiring me, I advise him that things like repairs that he doesn't or she doesn't know about may come up. Right. So be ready for that. Ah, uh, primum. Okay. So it primum. Exactly. So what I do always do, and I always done this from day number one. I don't know why. I think it's because I would do the same for myself. I walk throughout the house and I depict everything that I see. Like, hey, look, you should probably move that sofa. It's too bulky. It's on the way. Look, you have that nasty crack over there. I know somebody that can help you with that. Outside, mm -hmm. you have a beautiful backyard, but look at all those leaky faucets outside. I know somebody building the relationship, and then and you coach that client, yeah. that buyer yeah. or seller, into you know making that listing, that home irresistible to a buyer. Because then again, as an agent, you need to understand the market, and you understand buyers. Buyers are judges; they're going to judge everything. Okay, right. and uh, you need to make sure that you are cushioning that 
by doing the right thing and explaining to your seller what he needs to do prior to leasing the house. Because then that comes into effect in the negotiating table when you are suggesting a price right. for them. Okay, well, Mr. Seller, you know, I believe, you know, I could sell your house for 500000 but Michael Silo said that it's worth 525000 Well, you know, Silo is wrong. And this is something that you may be able to do to get it to 525000 right. And then I refer back to the list or we sign the contract, or take a walk around the house, and this is a honey-do list. You want your 525000 Do all this. Ah, uh, yeah. You're, so it's, that's your art part of it, yes. right? That's where you're really working the relationship of the client. Yes, because I'm there to help him out. Right. I'm there to like protect his yeah. equity. Exactly. Okay. I see. I yeah. like that. Protect the equity. Protect so the then equity. Why buy a house? You know, like it compared to, you know, as far as real estate investment, um, you know, and especially now in this market condition, why buy a house? Especially in this market condition. Well, I mean, two, three things come up to mind right away. Why buy a house? It's like the best savings account you're going to have. I mean, you are for sure to have a few hundred thousand dollars in 30 years time. So it's, it's safe money pretty much. Well, yeah, sense, right? you know, uh, part of that mortgage, you have your PITI, which is your principal, the actual cost of the house, mm -hmm. your interest, the money that is costing you to borrow the money from the bank, right? taxes, everybody pays taxes, mm -hmm. property taxes, and homeowners insurance. Okay. Which is the fundamental on every basic loan. Obviously, Leon here will tell you that there's more to that when you get into certain types of loans. For well, example, that, what? Like the homeowner's insurance ties back into the fire insurance issue that you had where it's three and a half times the amount. So that's the insurance part. That's your hazard insurance. So a tree falls in your house, the wind blows the roof off, it catches on fire. That's hazard insurance. You have to have that. And then the interest is the interest that you're paying on the loan to the bank. That's the money that the bank's making for loaning you the principal, right. which the principal is the loan that you're getting. Right. You might have put a large down payment, a small down payment. You also might have mortgage insurance, which is a monthly insurance payment that you pay if you put less than 20% down. So there's different ways to do it. But this all reminds me, or just not reminds me, it makes me tie into the trust factor. And this is what, what's important to me because I'm in the industry as well, but I'm going to purchase a house in the next six months. I got to navigate this, this market that we're going into, but I'm going to trust. I'm not, I could do it myself, but I'm not going to do it myself. I'm going to work with a real estate professional because I know the value of that professional. So for example, with the fire insurance thing reminds me of when, so we're here at the, we're here at our ranch. So we have a studio at our ranch here in the foothills. So it's we're in the beautiful foothills. studio. Thank oh, you. Thank you. And this is in a high fire hazard area. So we're in like the extreme fire hazard yeah. insurance, but guess what? I want to live in the hills. That's part of the cost of, of dealing with that is living in this, in this area. So that. I would rely on my real estate professional at the end of the day where it's like, well, I think I'm doing the right thing. But at the end, it's like, Michael, should I do this? And mm -hmm. it's like, if he's like, yes, and I have a relationship with him and I'm going to have a relationship with him. I know that in 30 years from now or 20 years from now, or in this case, five years it took to build $200,000. Like literally it was only five years to build $200,000. You're telling me in five years, if I, so if I was able to buy a house and in the right conditions with the right house, in five years, I could make money off of it, maybe. Oh, yeah. And that's another factor that goes back to your question. Like, why should right. I buy a house? Because now you don't only have the responsibility of a, of a mortgage account, but now you're going to start increasing your equity. Mm. Okay. Equity is the money that your house is going to evaluate over time. Okay. Which in the event that you need to open a business up with, you can refinance that money. You need equity to do that. Yeah. So you can need equity to do it. Correct. So to finish up with this question, so that's part number one. Uh, number two is going to teach you how to budget better. Mm. Hopefully everybody's buying a house in a young age. I mean, the first time I bought a house was when I was 29. 
Wow. I wish I would have done it earlier. Okay. I see people nowadays. Some of my clients are 21 years old. That's me right now. They are barbers. You know, they are uh, software technicians. Okay. You know, so that's another factor of it. And then the last one in, and most important, the one that hits the heart is, you know, every home is a foundation of a family. You want a house where you can raise your children, right? You know, come home, kick your shoes off, cook a good meal, go in the back, jump in that pool, or yeah. just run around with the kids and the puppies. That pride of ownership. That pride of it's ownership. A big that deal. American dream. It man. is a big deal. People, um, I think if you haven't bought a house because you're meant, you know, I think that's a big thing that people don't take into account that feeling. You know, it, it becomes a transaction. We know the feelings because we've seen people. Just we've made people very successful or provide a lot of joy to families oh and my goodness. over the years. Like it's pretty big, but that that it's a value you can't discount. That pride, that pride of ownership. It's, it's part of the value. So let me let me do so so today. So yes. you know we're recording this in late spring in May of 2020. So we're dealing with the a pretty, peak of the purchasing real estate market. You think, but except we're at 20 percent unemployment. Banks are in a, in a serious issue. Um, there's a liquidity issue. Um, we're in a recession. Uh, there's numbers out there that, which we're going to put them in real perspective quickly because uh, 20% unemployment sounds like, like very, a very, very scary number. However, put it in perspective. If you shut the doors, you're going to have 20% unemployment. You open the doors, you're not going to have 20% unemployment, but you will there's going to be people that will lose their jobs. There's going to be companies that will not be able to open back up again because this has been too significant of a financial impact on them. They're not going to make it through. So that's sad to say, but that's what's going to happen. If companies don't make it through, the employees can't go back to work. They'll have to find another job. It's going to be, there's going to be something, but it won't be 20% unemployment. You're going to start seeing it drop over the next few months as, as businesses open up. But it sounds like that's uh, like... Like, how would you buy a house in an environment like that? It must be impossible, you would think, to buy a house with 20% unemployment. We're hearing all these issues. Like, like you can't show houses or social distancing. Like, so, I mean, are there no more open houses? Like, people, how do you how do you buy a house today? Like, how do I go see a house? Oh, man, that's a great question. And, you know, as we evolve, we need to assimilate with times. I honestly didn't think in my lifetime I would see something like this, mm -hmm. that you have to come outside your house wearing a mask and gloves because you might get this microphone, you know, flying into your nose and jacking up your lungs and just killing you. Right. So it's, it's, it's amazing to me because now you have to make a choice every time you leave your house. Okay, do I go to work or... Do I put myself at risk? What right. do I do? So how or has other people at risk or other people at risk? So uh, what do we do? Well, just let me tell you this. Um, last week in my market, um, I, I studied my market daily, which is the city of Riverside and Corona in Eastvale, but mostly Riverside because that's where my home is and my children live. So last week we had 71 new listings Come on the market. 71, you know, it's a decent number. Okay. In a week. In one week, seven days. In a recession. In a recession. And In probably the biggest recession this generation is going to see. Mm -hmm. I I hope. We'll see. <laughs> so, wood. yeah, knock on wood on that one. So, where was I at? 71 houses came on. 71 the houses. Yep. The same week, 68 houses went into escrow. Wow. Okay. So it's like almost 100% of the houses. So 96% of that went into escrow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Then if you look at the In closings, a time when people can't even see In a, a time house. where thousands, millions of Americans are unemployed. In a time where four weeks ago, almost 8 million Americans filed for unemployment. But people, are still buying houses. Where, but people are still buying houses. How are they still buying these houses? How? How? Okay. Well, fortunately, we have the essentials. You know, we have the, the realtors and lenders. Mm -hmm. We have the doctors, mm -hmm. nurses, mm -hmm. you know, Essential officers, yeah. uh, teachers, teachers. Yeah. 
uh, food providers. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say restaurant owners uh, because unfortunately we have thousands of those and they are closing down because they are not a solvent compared to like, uh, I don't know, a casting cleaver or, you know, an El Torito franchise mm -hmm. that is able to provide curb, right. you know, service. Um, but we have a market of people, uh, people that have money that are actually able to provide 20% down who have actually been preparing themselves for a time like this. Ah. And now that this government is giving us these beautiful mortgage rates, you know, people are really motivated. Well, I can share this with you as well. Because, Please. Um, last month, our bank, I work for a mortgage banker. So a mortgage banker is, uh, the, we have our own, so there's a difference between in banking. So you have brokers, which broker loans out around town. You have bankers, which have their own underwriters, own processors, their own relationships. And then you have your like traditional bank, like a Wells Fargo Bank of America that does checking account, savings account, et cetera. So all of those can get mortgages to buy homes. You'll notice in an environment like this, your true professional is going to come to the top. So that's the true mortgage banker, not the Wells Fargo. It's going to be the, the mortgage banking company like ours. We're one of the top 50 in the nation. We're American Financial Network. They just posted their highest month ever in history in April. They funded $1 billion in the month of April in this environment, in this epidemic environment. A billion dollars. Are they... Still doing HELOCs and cash out refis? No. So, I mean, they are there. So what happened with the banks now, and this ties into what, what you do. Yeah. So the banks now have tightened all their regulations. So there's plenty of money available. But again, it's to the people that, that um, can qualify a little bit better. So, for example, we're looking for W-2 income jobs, which is the majority of the population works on the W-2. Literally, the majority is. Right. So that's your, your statement at the end of the year. They take taxes out. They report it to the government. That's gold right now, W-2. Correct. Because 1099 income means you're running a tax return, and the underwriters will want to see a tax return. Typically, 1099 people write a lot of their income off. I need the income to qualify for the loan. So those are the business owner. Those are business owners. So mm -hmm. business owner loans, very difficult to get. You know, restaurant owner right now, I don't think an underwriter would even make a loan to a, net, a restaurant owner right now, just because it's that business. Another business owner, like a mechanic shop, might get a loan. But a restaurant owner right now, there's so much uncertainty that banks have shut down funding in a lot of areas. Equity Lines is another one. An equity line is a second mortgage tied to your house. Um, in, in normal times, you could get that. You can qualify for that. But the banks now that are doing the second loans are really concerned about what's happening. And right. so they have to they have to pull back. Now, from our perspective, and, and I want Michael's opinion on this, but from our perspective, we don't have a problem in real estate values in this economy. So in this recession right now, I don't see, and, and we study this, like you study your data, we study this as bankers. We don't see a problem in real estate values. So when people can't get, get loans because they're out of work, Banks will tighten regulations. Those people come out of the market. They can't buy. But there's many, many people that can buy. Like Mike's, 96% of people could still buy. They still bought those houses. Right. And they're in the suburbs. So suburbs now are becoming more desirable because people are in dirty cities is how they look at it. They, they want to get away. They want to get away. So equity lines start drying up. This recession was not caused by real estate like the last one in 07. So that was caused by real estate and banking. This has caused... This isn't even caused by the coronavirus, this recession. This recession is caused by the financial shutdown and the pullback. That's what caused it. But we were kind of already in a recession before this even started mm -hmm. anyway. Right? Yeah, this is like a self-induced heart attack. Exactly. Feels like a biological slash economic war, to be honest with you. Yeah. Just, like the, way, just the way it's happening. It's just, it's not very clear mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know... A good friend told me, if you don't understand something, just don't stay away from it. Mm. If you don't really understand something, don't invest in it. Right. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So, I don't know. This is, I don't know. This is, like you said, it's, um, 
but there seems to be opportunity here. Oh, uh, there's always going to be opportunities. Always. There's and always that's what going we have to, be to look for, I guess. So that's what us, we have been getting ready for mm-hmm. because we lived through the 2007 and eight. Right, so you know. Ooh, we know. We know. I we know. See. And it was interesting this time to watch this happen. It happened quickly. But as it happened, we knew what was happening. We knew what they were going to do. So we knew what banks would do. And we knew what the government would have to do. Because the government's going to write the checks. That's just what's going to happen. Otherwise, okay. your country's going to be in trouble. And we also knew that they're going to open it back up because they won't shut it down that long well, you because can. you'll have a b- bigger problem with the financial impact you're doing to your country than you would of what a virus could do. And in viruses, you know, it's sad and all that, but the numbers are not what they thought they were. So the numbers are not as big as they thought they were. So there's a lot, like you said. So this might backfire. The in decisions made the decisions by made. the government by shutting Mm. everybody out yep. by sending orders of a staying at home well and this is this is oh, the this is the beauty or of part of it like i need when you and i were talking about this other day i was like we need to talk about this because the backfire is not now because no. you have 96 oh, percent no. of people still buying houses but the backfire hasn't started yet because no. the backfire is coming because oh for sure it's you've coming for sure sp- but it should be okay for real estate values, but it's coming because people are not going to have jobs. You're going to have renters that can't make rent payments, I would imagine. That means you're going to have investors. So if those investors hold those homes and they're spread thin and the tenant doesn't make the payment, the investor can't make the payment on the mortgage because typically they have a mortgage on that house. Right. They might hold more than one house, right? So they, they're going to start losing it. And then when those payments don't get made, you start to create a, a an REO environment, a Correct. foreclosure environment, a short sale environment. Yeah, but that's probably coming in a few months. You think? I, I mean, what? What do you? I I'm feeling December, January, January 2021. But you never know. You know, real estate, residential real estate, is probably in a situation like this is going to be the last thing to get hit. Right, because that's before, the safety before of the home. everything really goes mm. south. But do you see values? Dropping significantly no, in residential real estate? at all. If the matter of fact, I just listed a house in Monterey Park, Los Angeles, at eight hundred eighty no eight hundred ninety nine thousand. We got multiple offers. We the first three days it was on the market. We had about one hundred thirty four people come through the house with How COVID nineteen and everything. How many? One hundred thirty four agents in and buyers. Three days. In three days. At a nine hundred thousand. We were showing the house range. from seven a.m. to nine p.m. I know a little bit. This is one of your houses, right? This is one of my house. One of your flips. And, mm-hmm. and why? Because now with this whole COVID nineteen, everything has changed as far as aesthetics of real estate. The landscape of showing a property is no longer the same. Forget about open houses. Forget about you know trying to get into a house with just a couple hour call no yep. now you're not only required to be fully qualified for a loan because you can only go see a house if you are willing and able and ready to make an offer so you, if you're a looky loo stay home yeah save lives right, right. that makes yeah. sense yeah That's stay good. home good and then not only that but you have to be willing to sign this disclosure which is a pead I've where pead it's crazy it, it's like it's before you you even go, you have to acknowledge the fact that, number one, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but the main ones. And this is you, the buyer, letting the seller know that you have not had any fevers or coughs or chills. Uh, you will be wearing a gl- pair of gloves, mm-hmm. some booties, and a face mask. And only up to two people with their agent are able to be in that property at once. And it is requested for the seller to vacate that home. Wow. And while you're in that house, you have to maintain a six feet distance mm. and touch nothing. I mean, nothing. Wow. So it's strict. It is really strict. Wow. That PEAD yeah. form. Do you know what that 
that stands for? What is that? Can you pull that form up? Yeah, it's, it's a PEAD. Uh, it's a new disclosure. It should just come up. PEAD, real estate disclosure. Yeah, it's like because uh, you mentioned like it the other day, and when you said it, the words were significant. They were impactful. What it meant because, yeah. and it starts to make sense because you're going to sign, you're going to sign everything away because you'd have everything. sellers suing buyers if they got sick, and it would just buyers suing. Correct. It would yeah. just be a whole mess. So it spells out for a coronavirus property entry advisory and declaration. Property this entry advisory and declaration. And declaration. So, so this is what you're going to see now going forward. This is what we see every time someone shows my house and every time I need to go show that house. So now you really need to get prepared. Right. So fully, so fully qualified. So there's, when you get qualified for a loan, there's different stages. So, so a lot of times you talk to somebody or we do business a little bit differently these days because we're, we're been doing this a long time. I, I know Michael well enough to know that he's not going to show anybody a house unless they have a loan. Oh, yeah. There's, you just There's just no you, way. There's just no way. And I'm asking for proof. Proof. Yeah. And I, mean, you I can want talk, to see. Yeah, well, that makes sense. There's, so sometimes you talk to a buyer and they say, oh, yes, I was pre-qualified. Well, pre-qualified is a broad term. It no, could I mean understand. that you basically just spoke to a bank and the bank said, based on what you told me, we can probably get you a loan. That's not enough. You need to have loan approval right so approval approval means a bank us we've looked at your w-2s your tax returns if you're 1099 we're going to look really close at you now what business are you in and right now as a bank so you have those disclosures our disclosures on a bank we're calling up until the moment we fund and we're calling their managers like direct hr managers to make sure they're not furloughed that they still have a job, that it's not at risk. And so you have people that have to say that, like, you know, they can't make that up. Well, it's good. You guys are minimizing this backlash that's going to occur because if you just start giving away money, then it's going to be worse in the long run, right? Yep. So yep. it's good that people are being pre-qualified and it's very strict right now and that you have strict agreements. Well, because, that's a good point. You, you know, know you have to do that. That's going to minimize the damage and you guys are on the forefront. Well, of we never did it anyway for the last, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, we don't show people property or deal with people. I no, won't, I don't want to work. I mean, it's taking COVID-19 to actually make the majority right. of agents fully qualify, you know, a buyer and their agent. But we only work like that anyway. Yeah. So for us, you I know. Mean, this is a walk in the park. This, walk. Is yeah. what the, this is by default. Right. And another disclosure, I'm okay with disclosures because they protect people. Yeah. And, that, and there, there's a very... Um, litigious environment people like to sue each other so yeah. just i'm okay with disclosures I'm, yeah it doesn't scare me you know so that's not the peed that we're looking for but that's yeah, okay no, that's, that's, that's okay. a different peed yeah. but so so proof of funds fully approved loan signed disclosures booties gloves mask dealing with a top agent for sure because at this point you're gonna look at who you're dealing with it's like okay so i'm about to make my biggest life investment yes. i need to know that i'm working with somebody that that has a lot of experience. We work like this before anyway. Yes. And I'm not just, I mean, it's obvious because there was a lot of talk before this about, oh, Amazon's coming in and Redfin and Zillow. And okay, guess what? You There's a certain small percentage of people that might be able to do a transaction all on the internet without a lend, with, could just do it on the internet, but not anymore. You don't get Where that relationship. Where is Purple Bricks at? Hmm? Exactly. Where is Purple Bricks at? Yeah. Explain what Purple Bricks yeah, is. No idea. Well, Purple Bricks is, uh, they try to be a real estate company here in Southern California. I think they come from the UK. I think so. Okay, South where, Beach. you know, they are pretty much a discount real estate broker that, as a seller, helps you out, <laughs> upload your own pictures or pictures that they take for a fee. Because everything is a la carte or used to be a la carte because mm -hmm. they're no longer around. That was um, fast. That was fast. <laughs> they, and a, they just wow. pumped so many millions, maybe a billion or two of dollars into marketing because that's how companies like that, that provide that sort of real estate platform where it's a la carte and pretty much the seller has to practically negotiate their own deals. So there's not really agents. There is no representation. Platform. I see. There's no relationship. Which is the problem. Yeah. There's nobody, there's nobody, uh, 
telling you in the ear at that moment where you need to make a decision what yep. you should be doing. Like, right. Which is like someone like me. I don't know that you, much. Exactly. I'm new. So, so you're so going to count on us. Exactly. But I want to be able to do that. I want to form that relationship because that's what's going to help me later on. You yes. know, when I go back to sell my house or to buy another house, I have you who is, a Correct. you know, the, the relationship we made yeah. is going to be more than just one purchase or one transaction. It's, it's not going to be it's for life. It's for life. It's for life. Yeah. And, and, it's, it, it is, and it is changing because, you know, you got new generations. You got the millennials. You know, everything is over the phone. Mm. Everything, business conversations is over the phone. And uh, they are a huge pool of uh, future buyers. So you need to learn how to deal with them. And they're right. coming. The millennials are oh, coming now coming. to the Inland Empire and to the suburbs. They've been there. And, you know. They were in the cities, but they're coming back now because I, I talked to them. And they're like, they, they're, so a lot of people have, we're more fortunate. We live on a big ranch. Like, we're pretty cool. But there's a lot of people that have been hit hard. Like, they're locked down in cities. And they are saying, we can't wait to get out of the city. We don't want to live in the city anymore. We'll, we'll drive, we'll commute, we'll, vir- we'll work virtually. A lot of people won't have to go to work the same again. We funded a billion dollars with nobody in the office. They're all doing it virtually. Well, because you can do it virtually. Because you can do it exactly. virtually. And you can live in the suburbs, you can live in a ranch, mm-hmm. you can live with your pool, you can have a good time, do your barbecues and all that, and not be stuck in a dirty city. And you can make money doing it. If you buy a house, right? It's yes. you're going to get money. House. And more than ever, you know, nowadays with a whole coronavirus, everybody wants to be home mm-hmm. with their family. Mm-hmm. Right. And I can tell you firsthand because I, before this show, uh, we were talking about me selling my beautiful house that we had and how I wish I had it now. Mm. But it was part of my business plan to sell that house on year number five. Mm. So we did. And then we went on a nice vacation to Kauai and came back to rent an apartment where I was paying $2,500 a month mm. for a two-bedroom, two-bathroom on the third floor. That must no have hurt elevator. as a real estate yeah. investor to be paying rent <laughs> to yeah. an apartment. Right? But you know why I did it? I stuck myself into a six-month lease and gave myself six months to find a house That's or smart. at least flip a house with the money to that I just got from the sale of my Nice, beautiful move. house. Yeah. yeah. So I had two options. So I either find a house right away, or if I'm not finding a house right away, I'm working the money still. Okay. Right. Unfortunately, we didn't find that house. And then we made the decision to acquire one of our flips that later on we decided this is a great rental home because this is in a good neighborhood with a good school close to everything. So we're going to make it a rental. And then we decided we that we need to move into the house because we haven't found anything. I'm tired of rent, paying rent. Right. You know, I already spent, what, 2,500 times seven that's, months. Yeah. That's a lot of money, man. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a lot of money for a f- down payment. Yeah. Okay. So we ended up moving into this rental, which obviously I had to beautify because that's what we do in like four weeks. Okay. And then... I had to move my family from an apartment on the third floor when COVID is just crushing us, man. Uh, and it's raining, and I have kids, and I have to move in into a house with, like, workers working, cleaning, people cleaning. Beautifying is happening. And then movers. And there we are just uh, Tie this. that in. So look at the, the circle on that. Tie that back to the little kid on the bus in Peru with the shining path. That's crazy. So you, you look at that. Like, now you know, like, so you would look at that, and some people might like say, oh, that's pretty rough. But there's other things that are more more difficult. And that... I the, see that as the work ethic is always there. Because you went from, I have the most beautiful house, to let me put myself into a position where I'm not as comfortable, where I'm doing something I don't want to do, which is paying rent. Mm-hmm. But why am I doing it? The reason why is because I have a bigger plan and a bigger picture and I want to go somewhere. And as long as you have that clarity about where you want to go, nothing can get on your way, man. Mm, Honestly, honestly, because this was the plan. I told my wife and she understood. Yeah, we're going to sell this house as much as it's going to hurt her because I don't get attached to houses. I mean, I love my family. My home is where whatever they're at. But. I told her, five-year plan, let's walk out. So we walk out, man, and we actually moved into our new home on March 19th. Mm. And 
that's the day where the orders to stay home for everybody in California right, to stay home team. just yeah. landed on us. You just got it in time then. You Talk got about the yeah. timing. Yeah. yeah. The next day, we were just putting stuff away. And I think three days after that, when we finally had time to sit down, make a martini, and just talk about it, we're like, whew. <laughs> yeah, but that's we a good it. feeling. You, good we job. We made it. We made well, it. Well, look at you. You're doing it. So you're helping your clients. And that 60, you know, the 68 houses, the 96%, but you're doing it yourself. Yes. So correct. you're, so you know, and that's one of the things I've found is like, if you want to put yourself in a client's position, do it yourself and you'll understand. Well, it seems like that's where the business part of it comes from is doing it yourself. You know, mm-hmm. like that's the doing the job of being a banker or an agent is only one portion. You guys seem to understand it from all asset aspects. And that comes from doing it yourself and mm-hmm. from buying the houses and from seeing it from so many different angles. Oh, and that's yeah. what makes you qualified. And live in it because we lived it. Exactly. We've experienced it firsthand. We made, oh man, we made so much money. We lost so much money. We, lost, we spent so <laughs> we much We spent money. so much money. We learned so much. But you don't regret that. No, that's your life. heck no, man. Yeah. I, no, no regrets. No There's regrets. No regrets. Because you don't know. I mean, this is a good example of you don't know what's coming. Six months ago, you had no idea this was coming. Yeah. I mean, no idea. So no regrets. So no, we've traveled and uh, you love to travel. Like what are some of your hobbies that you do? I would think sound uh, well, like you're a food person. My, yes. Well, I, I can you could tie cook. that back into the fact that you grew up with food businesses your oh, yeah. whole life, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, as a little kid, I used to go to the market with my grandma. My grandma was deaf. And so I had to go with her wow. uh, so that I could negotiate in her behalf. <laughs> Always you know, negotiating. You yeah. know, a kilo of potatoes that <laughs> is selling for two soles for like a, a sole and 75 cents. Yeah. You know? Nice. So my grandma was an amazing cook. And uh, I would go and buy produce with her, come to the house, carry the bags, you know, help her prep. And I would just sit there, watch her cook. And you learn. know? And then I would learn. So that sort of like, kind of like, I felt What'd that. What she cook? What was like some of your favorite? Oh, you remember? arroz con pollo. Oh. She made the best mm. arroz con pollo. That sounds good. She would use the bones on the meat. And uh, she she grabbed a lot of the m- freshest cilantro mm. and ají verde to make it with. And she would just cook the rice. She would fry it a little bit with butter enough. So it has got that nice golden brown and just wash it down with like, dark beer oh, and Peru. garlic your food has peruvian such a fusion oh, food man. right it's mixed with like I there's mean, asian in it and yes there's we like have a, l- a, a like large j- uh, japanese community yeah, that I lives there that. i mean one of our presidents was japanese fujimori wow so yeah. cooking look cooking, him up traveling. that's the guy that blew up all the terrorists at, at the island at what? an island across from the coast of peru Okay, we were going to wrap it up and just but tell this story really quick. Tell, wait, oh, you want to know? Yeah, just, yeah, oh, yeah, I got okay, it up. Okay, okay. okay. So uh, this is when we were already here. Mm-hmm. I was living here with my family. So Fujimori comes into so presidency. Japanese prime this minister ja- or no, president? No, no, no. What this is he? He's from Japanese descent. But his he title said, in Peru. He's but president? he says he was born here in, in Peru. Okay. Okay, but 99% Japanese for right. sure. And uh, he was a president, and I a lot of people put him down for a lot of different reasons, but I think he took care of the number one problem that Peru had, and that was the terrorism, Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso. He got rid of it. And how do you get rid of how a do plague? You do that? How do you get rid of something that kills innocent people, yeah. that is crushing your economy, yeah. and is making you afraid to leave your house? Yeah. H- how do you deal with that as a president? So this guy... You know, it starts attacking the cells, the terrorist cells. I mean, he starts infiltrating groups. My brother was involved in that. My uncles were involved in that because they were from the Guardia Civil. So they would go after the them. Civil War? Undercover, undercover, playing their same game and busting every single one of them up and putting them into jail. So they made a special jail for all these guys. Wow. You know, on an island. I think it was called El Pampon, the jail. And it is in an island. It's a small island. I think it's about two-mile radius. It's small. 
So they fleed all the terrorists there. And this guy put all the terrorist heads in there too. Everybody. And he just called the Navy and had him blow it up. <laughs> Jesus. <Wow>. Dude. <laughs> That's Talk about owning it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk about it. Do what needs to get done. Oh, you got yeah. a problem? Let me fix oh, that for you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So this guy, I mean, it took a lot of, you know what? Mm -hmm. Because when you do something like that, you are gonna have to welcome victory with criticism. Oh, a lot of know? criticism, so especially now. After that, he was just, you know, hit down with a stick so hard he ended up in jail. Yeah. I don't know yeah. why. I mean, because you kind of. You can't yeah. really do that, but it's a great story. You know, I mean, yes. like you said, is he a hero or is he a madman? It's a little bit of both at a that point. Yes. But that's sometimes you have to be that. It's, you, you have know, to there's play a fine that. Line. Yeah. You have to play that sometimes. Yeah. But well, that's to the extreme. Wow, that was a good good story. Thank you. Yeah. So, so don't be a terrorist. Don't be a terrorist. <laughs> don't be a, in Peru, don't be a, here, kids. Don't be a dick. <laughs> don't be a dick. Don't, don't be, be a dick. dick. Yeah, I agree like, with that. So oh, cool. So what what do you see as some of uh, just to to start to wrap it up? This has been really interesting because this truly this is the life stories that paint a bigger picture. That's yeah. what this podcast is about. Is because it's so interesting with because there I've learned so much more about you today. Yeah, you know, and I I've known you for it. twenty <laughs> years. You know, but but we didn't. You know, this is a a, a medium to talk about it, and it's it's, it's cool. great. What evolves it's really interesting and that those stories will inspire they'll motivate educate you know and that's what we're getting across is that this is life and everybody has a story everybody's life story is so yeah. beautiful and yours is amazing and that's why we wanted to hear your voice and that's why today going forward you want to trust the people you're working with know the experience like look at the experience that you have so it's like so oh my my agent we're in an epidemic it's like yeah probably mike's okay like he's on it like i know mike's got it you know but that's what that's important to me yes. and, and you you've been through it you've seen a lot of stuff so yeah thank goodness i've been prepared for stuff like this yeah. and you know yes we're going through this and we get to go through it together so mm -hmm. might as well make the best of this make the best of it soon we'll be able to travel again we'll be able to travel again um uh, We'll have parties. People need to really get out. Mm -hmm. Not get out of their homes, but get out of that mentality of, oh, shoot, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. No, man. We're you not know, all going to die. If no. your you know, daily routine was broken, you know, build a new one. Well, and if you're, if you're that, you know, research numbers. So if, if you want to know, and we, we don't know the numbers yet. No. But you can, based on the history of how the countries are run and what it is, I, I would, we don't know anything, but I would be safe to say when you look at all the numbers, it, it's probably not as bad as they thought it were going to be. And if you compare it to a lot of things like heart attack and smoking and cancer and regular flu and all that, all the numbers are, right. are high. So this is going to evolve into a certain way. It won't be the same again, but we have to have, we have to have the arts so you have to have stage and play in Broadway and movies. Like we're we're gonna live with that. There might be things that do change, but I have a it's lot. It's gonna of, go on. I think gonna that's go what on. you what you're trying to say. Yeah. It's gonna carry on. We will recover. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, but we have there to stick is. together now. Yeah. And we work do. Through it, yeah, you know? we do. And we stick, like you said, together and with knowledgeable people. Correct. So thank you hey, man. so much. This for was so much up. fun. Isn't that cool? We have to have a part two. Have to have a part. I'm two. Yes. yes. Well, I you do want to. I do want to have a part two in a few months because yeah. you want to look back and see. Let's look at what is going on in some time from now because values have not been affected. Right. Sales are high. We're getting multiple offers on properties. If your property is listed for sale and it's overpriced, you will need to adjust because people are no longer playing that game. Right. And yes, there's a lot of people with money buying real estate. And <laughs> yes, it's still a good idea to buy real estate, residential. However, make sure that if you're going to buy a house, you have a good job. Yep. Be realistic. Be realistic. Don't okay? overspend. Don't overspend. So this is where we can look to you then as Correct. the advisor, as right. building this relationship. So where can we find you? You know, if somebody is in this position to buy a house, you know, how can we, how can people reach out to you? I think the easiest way to... Hit me up is through Nugent Group Real Estate. Okay. At Instagram. Okay. On Instagram. Okay. 
you'll look me up and you'll see my wife and I just doing these amazing things. With we'll have the links people. to that in the description then yes. of the podcast. So and people will uh, be able to find it in the link of Nugent the podcast. Group Real yeah, Estate. The Nugent Instagram Group link. Real estate. Riverside, Corona. Instagram. Yeah. The, but all over Southern California. We're in LA right now, you're in LA, baby. And you're in Pasadena, Altadena, LA. We're in Altadena, Pasadena. Right now, we're negotiating an offer on this beautiful home on the hills of Altadena. Nice. Altadena is mm, nice. a cool spot. Yeah. I used to go to Pasadena nice. City College years ago. It's so beautiful. It's good. Well, thank you again for Thanks for, for having coming. me, guys. Yeah, we'll do a part two so we can, so to all the listeners, so that you can see. Because yeah. one point in this is I was listening to... Uh, another podcast and one of the things they were saying is about communication and how do you get accurate information and it just made me think like if you want accurate reporting and accurate news talk to people that are actually doing it yes. as opposed to just listening to the news all the time let's talk to people that are really doing it because that's how you're going to find out what's going on but definitely recap in a month or two from now. Yeah, we'll recap. Really we'll, get back. we'll come back on this and keep everybody We'll in, give you some form. real numbers. And thank <laughs> you to our sponsors. So American Financial Network the mortgage banking company I work with, Snack Bar, Whole Food Energy Bar Company. Oh, I can't wait to eat this one here. Nugent Group Real Estate. Snack Bites, Vanilla Chai Latte. I'm going to eat the mint. So thank you, sponsors. Mint brownie. And thank you, Michael. And Thanks. Yeah, the big coupon codes and links at the show notes. Thanks. Awesome. This has been an episode of Terrestrial Tales, life stories that paint a bigger picture.